right, let's uh, open our Bibles this evening for our study tonight in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. And when you find that, if you could find Exodus chapter 1 as well, so we'll be able to bounce back and forth a little bit and apply these verses that Paul sets before us. Paul wrote this letter to the Hebrews to remind them of what they had in Christ. Sometime before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Jews, especially Christian Jews, were suffering tremendously. It started really about 45 or so AD when the church itself was being attacked by the Romans. It got worse, obviously, when Nero came to power and Rome was burned down and he blamed the church. But these saints, these Jewish saints, already had difficulty because they were set aside by their families for converting to Christianity and now the Lord hadn't come back and things were getting worse and some folks were contemplating defecting. Some had quit coming to church altogether. And Paul spends 10 and a half chapters of this book giving to these Jewish believers every possible angle to say, look, Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one that was promised through the scriptures that were given to you. And so he has come by his blood to open a pathway to, to life. Those ten and a half chapters are probably some of the best insights you will ever find in the New Testament into the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. But having presented his case, Paul then stops in the middle of chapter 10, beginning in verse 19, uses the word therefore, and says, all right, so if you know all of these things, what kind of life are you to be living? And to the end of the chapters, really to the end of the book, Paul's whole pitch is, if you will, you know, God has always called his people to live by faith. doesn't matter if there are good times or bad there was always this issue of perseverance and, and trusting the Lord, and his timetable was very different than ours. In fact, he said at the end of chapter 10, the just should live by faith. That's what God's called us to do. So before we continue our Through the Bible on Wednesday nights and go to the book of Joshua, we came here to chapter 11 just to discuss one thing. What kind of faith pleases God? And we committed 16 weeks to it, and we're about halfway through, I guess. All of the studies are available online, so you can check those out. But... Suffice it to say, there is a faith that pleases God, and then there's a faith that really isn't biblical at all. So we looked at the definition of faith in verses 1, 2, and 3. We, we then looked at the life of Enoch. We looked at the life of Noah. We spent quite a bit of time looking at Abraham and his children, and Sarah, his wife, and Isaac and Jacob, and even Joseph in their dying days. We've gone through 22 verses, every little bit trying to add to our understanding of the kind of faith that God is pleased with. And last week we looked at the, the demands of three men. Well, one of, two of them were dying. One of them thought he was. He'd live a whole lot longer, actually over 40 more years. But they all requested that which God had promised that they hadn't received. I, I remember what God promised me. I want, you to, you know, I want you to take my bones, Joseph said, when we leave the land of Egypt and when God finally opens that door. And we looked at how faith drags the future into the presence and he gives substance to what you hope for and you get to enjoy that which you don't have yet because you so believe God will provide it. Well, tonight we, we, and for the next few weeks, we'll be looking at the faith of Moses, certainly the greatest hero to the Jews that there is. He is their lawgiver. He is the deliverer of God's people from Egypt. He is the hope for righteousness for the Jews because he gave them the law by which they hope to be right with God. He holds a tremendous place of honor. And yet Moses lived his life and the things that he did, God marks by faith. Tonight we are going to look at a couple of different things. Moses' life is broken up into three groups, very clearly. From the time he was born till he was 40 years old. At 40 years old when he left Pharaoh's house until 80 in the backside of the desert learning that God is in charge. And then from 80 to 120 years he brought God's people out. And then the Lord took him. So 40, 80, 120. That's pretty much the way his life breaks down. But this, this evening, we'd like to just look at verses 23 through verse 26. And then next week, we'll kind of jump ahead with him to when he is 80 years old. But we'll end there tonight. But here's what it says about faith and Moses. By faith, Moses, verse 23. When he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. They saw that he was a beautiful child. They were not afraid of the king's commandments. So the first by faith is really not Moses' faith, not much faith in Moses when he was born, but his parents had this tremendous trust in God 
at a very perilous time in their history. Mom and dad's name were Amram and Jochebed. So there's a couple of names for you guys that are having children. <laughs> you can read about it in Exodus chapter 6. But they no doubt passed along their trust and their faith in God to a, a child that was born to them, a third child actually. And, and not only that, but in, in, a, in a nation under captivity and amongst the people that were for the most part separated from God by faith at all, um, they stand out. And their faith was passed on. And unlike Abraham, who grew up with idolatrous parents and yet came to know the Lord by God's work in, in his heart at a later age, Moses grew up in a family that loved the Lord and had great confidence in him, even here in the worst of conditions, being willing to trust him by faith. So go back to Exodus, and let's take a look at what we might learn. Remember the verse, right? The verse says what? By faith, when he was born, <clears throat> Moses was hidden three months by his parents. They hid him because he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. In chapter 1, verse 5 of Exodus, we learn that, and you probably knew already, that when Joseph was in Egypt, 70 people came of Joseph's family, and they became the nucleus of what would become the nation of Israel and a nation that God would use and through whom he would work. For a while, 30 years or so, because Joseph was alive, things were fine. The Pharaoh loved Joseph, his family was treated like royalty, but then Joseph died. And for the next 400 years, this, this ever-growing population of Jews became a tremendous threat, both by their size and by their ability, it seems, to sustain life, at least in a physical sense, to the Egyptians. So much so that we read in verse 9 of chapter 1, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come and let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And in the event of a war, it should happen that they fight against us, and we would go out of the land. By the time that Moses was born, the people had dwelt in the border province called Goshen for about 350 years. They numbered exponentially so that 80 years from the time Moses was born, there would be between two and a half and three and a half million people that were living in the land of Egypt. A, a, a huge number, to say the least. And they would be led out by Moses. We are told in verse 11 of chapter 1 that in the process of this growth of the nation, that the the Pharaoh and the Egyptians set taskmasters over the Jews to afflict them with burdens, building the cities for Pharaoh, and there's some of them listed. And the more, it says, verse 12, but the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel, and the Egyptians made them to, to serve with rigor, made their lives bitter with hard bondage. They had them working with mortars and bricks, all manner of service, and all their service in which they made them serve, they, they served with rigor. So the Egyptian solution for the substantial growth of, of God's people was to wear them out, break their spirits, subject them, enslave them to harsh labor. And yet instead of breaking them or killing them, they just kept growing, which I think has a spiritual application, right? I mean, sometimes there, there's the best times of spiritual growth for us when the persecution seems to be the strongest. No pressure, no growth. Lots of pressure. And from a physical sense, lots of growth. Well, over a period of time, leading us 350 years ahead, beginning in verse 15 through the end of chapter 1, um, the decision by the Egyptian pharaoh was that they should probably just start killing off every little boy that was born to the Jews. And they made a mandate to the Jews that any little boy that was born was to be thrown into the Nile and drowned. The midwives who feared the Lord did not at all obey those commandments. They chose to serve the Lord no matter what. And so, fearing God but not fearing the king, they saved the little male children alive. And when the, the king came to ask about that and why are you not obeying the rules, they, their answer was, well, the, the Hebrew women are much better shaped than those Egyptian women. Those, those babies are born and they're off to the fields again. Man, we can't even keep up with them. And God blessed these ladies who helped with the children being born. Verse 20, he dealt well with them. The people multiplied. They continued to grow. Because the midwives feared God, he provided households for them. And finally, in verse 22, 
before that day of Moses' birth, Pharaoh gave the order of destroying every male child of the Jews to all of Egypt. So it wasn't just the Jews now that were policing themselves. Now it was a mandate upon all of the people who lived under Pharaoh's control. Well, it was during that occasion or in that time under that kind of pressure that Moses is born. In fact, we read in verse 1 of chapter 2, the man of the house of Levi went and took for as a wife a daughter of Levi, and she conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was a beautiful child, that sounds like the verse we just read, isn't it? She hid him for three months, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him. I know I put Moses in the ark, but look, he goes into an ark. They dabbed it with asphalt and pitch. They put a child in it, and they laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. So we, we know that this was the third child of, of Amram and Jochebed. They already, he already had a brother named Aaron. He already had a sister named Miriam. And Aaron probably was born before the decree that you read about in chapter 1. And so we quickly turn from the faith of the midwives who are seeking to obey the Lord and honor life to the faith of the parents that Paul mentions and that God marks there in Hebrews chapter 11 as an example of faith. These parents who defied uh, at great personal risk, the order of Pharaoh. Notice in verse 2 that you read the same word you read in Hebrews. They, they saw that the, that the child was beautiful. Now, you know, if you read that carelessly, you might say, well, every parent thinks their kid's beautiful. I mean, even if he's not beautiful, parents never say that. Oh, he's all right, but he's hardly beautiful. No, every parent thinks that of their child. This is an interesting word, though, because this word doesn't just mean he, he looks good. It, it means to be chosen or to be proper. And in the context, the parents realized God had a plan for their son. And there was something different about him. They, regard, they regarded him in terms of God's purpose and God's calling. Um, it is mentioned by Stephen years later when he, he gives a sermon there in Acts 7 before they put him to death. And, and he mentions in chapter six, no, chapter 7 of Acts, and he said, at that time Moses was born, he was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up by his parents. They, they, they understood, the parents did somehow, we're not told that, that this boy was special. God had a plan for his life. And that is what drove them to what would continue to be their behavior of faith. Um, I doubt that they were aware of God's word to them about this being the proper time for th this fellow to be born. Um, God speaks about it in, in Acts 7 through Stephen's message that, that the Lord was going to bring out of bondage a people that he would call to himself and judge those who had kept him in bondage, all in the context of this fellow Moses. But I doubt that the parents understood that. But no matter what they perceived, their choice was right, but it was extremely dangerous, Right? I mean, there was a national law, you kill the baby if it's a boy. I don't know if they prayed for months for a girl. I might have. But the boy showed up, Moses, the chosen one, the one that God had his hand upon. You can learn very quickly from the Bible when you draw the lines as far as obeying the laws of the land. You know, the Bible teaches us that we're to be good citizens, right? That our citizenship is not here, but we're to be good citizens. You know, that those in authority God has placed there that we, we do our best job spiritually when we obey the laws of the land, even when we don't agree with all of them. You know? but, but here's the deal. When, when, when the laws of the land began to, to keep you from that which God has explicitly demanded of you, or when the laws of the land um, forbid you from doing those things, or demand of you an action that God would forbid, then you're obligated to go, I can't do that, I have to follow the Lord. But that's very few and far between in most places. There are some countries that certainly you'd have to apply that from day one. But beyond that, we're just to be good citizens, right? In prayer and service, we're to honor the Lord. But there are times when God has to be placed above the government. When Peter and John were, were told in Acts 4 not to preach anymore in Jesus' name, they went, yeah, well, we can only obey the Lord. And he told us to go preach. So they were willing to pay for the consequences, but they couldn't change the direction that God had given to them. And so they took that position. And I, I thank the Lord. That's usually not our situation. And, and God has given us great freedom. Um, we just need to be able to use it for his glory. I, I think about the boys. Well, they were probably adults in the days of Nebuchadnezzar who were demanded to, to bow down, right, to an image under penalty of death. And they rested in God's care. They wouldn't compromise. They said, well, if you kill us, that's great. God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we can't bow down. He's written the rules here. We can't bow to a, a false god. So those were the extremes, and ideally, uh, 
I think we're simply just to do good and pray for those over us and obey the law and all things. But here you see the midwives and the parents placing their own lives in jeopardy to obey God and disobey man, a, a wicked rule, and God blesses them both for it. We are told in verse 3 that the parents were able to get away with this for three months. Don't know what that means necessarily, but he was getting older, harder to hide, I guess. And in their seeking of the Lord, knowing God had put his hand upon them, they come up with a pretty interesting decision. And the decision is they'll put Moses in a little basket and they'll drop him off in the riverbank near where Pharaoh lived in the area where they would come out to bathe. And no doubt they would find this little kid. And you might wonder, and you say, well, could you put him in a worse spot? And the answer would be, no, I guess not, unless the Lord led you. And because they are pleasing the Lord, we, we trust that this is exactly what God placed upon their hearts. But imagine you as a parent. You know, that's the culture you live in. And, and whether you like it or not, the authorities find your child, that, that child dies. Or maybe your, your Egyptian neighbors. <laughs> Because everyone's kind of on the, on the hook. And so you do the best that you can, and then one day you just realize you, you've got to trust the Lord with this little kid that you believe he God has, has his hand upon, and you put him out in the Nile. But you put him out where you know someone's going to find him, where he's not going to go floating off and drown somewhere. You, you've done the best that you could, but how do you feel as a parent? You know, you feel, I, I would think, absolutely, you know, beside yourself. And yet you read in verse 23 what we looked at. When he was born, he was hidden three months by faith because he was a beautiful child. They believed God had called this child and they weren't afraid of the king's commandments. So this action, even the, the sending of that boy into the river, had nothing to do with fear as much as it had to do with God's leading. It isn't a fearful act. At least that's what Hebrews chapter 11 tells us. Verse 4 says, And his sister, that would be Miriam, stood afar off to know what would be done with him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, her maidens walking along the riverside. She saw the ark among the reeds. She sent her maids to get it. When she opened it, she saw a child, and the child was crying because it didn't like sailing. And so she had compassion on him. She said, This is one of the Hebrew children. So Miriam watches her little brother, Pharaoh's daughters, and her maiden finds the ark. She recognized the baby as a Hebrew. I guess he cried in Hebrew. I don't know how you... <laughs> God stirs her natural compassion. And God goes before Moses to protect this child. But by faith, his parents put him away. Right? They trusted this little boy to the Lord. Verse 7 says that the sister then went down bravely to Pharaoh's daughter and said, should I get one of the Hebrew women to nurse him for you? And she said, yeah, go. And she went and got his mom. And the Pharaoh's daughter said, could you take this child and nurse him, and I will pay you. So now mom has a job of being a mom. <laughs> right? Took the child and nursed him by, by Jewish practices, at least in those days, from everything we can gather, three to five years. She nurses this little boy, Moses, and takes care of him. And the child began to grow. And then at some point, verse 10, she had to give him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And so she called his name Moses because I've drawn him out of the water. So Miriam gets his mother, her mother, Jochebed, who become a paid nurse, raises her own son, and gets five years with him maybe to ingrain in him the faith that she had with her husband and, and, the, and the plans that God had for this little boy as much as they understood it. So there, there's something to be said for raising your kids early on you know, I always love the VBS because you, the kids are all excited, but there's things that happen in their hearts when they're that young that God has a way of just implanting, right, into, into her heart and into his heart, those little kids' hearts. So, but I, I just think about being seven months pregnant and hearing this edict go out, and, and then all of a sudden you, 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 can't, you can't really do anything else but set him sailing and pray for the best, and maybe people found out, and who knows. And then you set him off in a system steeped in the occult, I mean, these Egyptians were nothing but cultists. So five years of input, and then she hands them off. And Moses would grow up in Pharaoh's house. Acts 7 tells us that he grew up there uh, in the wisdom of Egypt, in the mighty wonders and deeds of, of, of the Egyptians, in the richest family in Egypt. This guy went to the richest place, the, the governor, the, the ruler of that part of the world. He was spoiled. He was a, a, an 
He was apparently a favorite son. He became the heir apparent to the throne. And from five years old to maybe 40 then, that's the kind of life that he lived. As Joseph had been in, in Pharaoh's court to bring Israel into Egypt to save her, remember that's how God sent Joseph ahead, now Moses goes to Pharaoh's court to bring them out of bondage. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty laughable the way God works in many ways. You know, the very decision that Pharaoh had hoped would destroy the Jews brought the deliverer of the Jews into his house. And he paid for his education, and he paid to raise him, and he took care of him, and then when he was done, he left and took the people with him. God has great ways, but here's these faithful parents <clears throat> who see God at work, and notice verse 23 back in Hebrew says, they weren't afraid of the king's commandment because faith made them fearless in the Lord to do what was right. Was it easy? No. <laughs> it was putting your greatest asset into the Lord's hands. I've always found it very interesting that we are willing to just trust the Lord when we don't care what happens. What are you doing about that, bro? Oh, I'm just trusting the Lord. Well, if it doesn't work out, well, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Like we don't care. And then you go, well, it's your child. You go, oh, God better come through. That's my child, right? All of a sudden, faith takes on an entirely different dimension. And it did in the life of Moses' parents. Verse 24, back in Hebrews, and don't lose your place in Exodus, says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, and he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, and he looked to the reward. Now Moses' upbringing the work of God kept his heart from, from year five, let's say, to year 40. And, and one thing Moses was able to see, according to what we read here and in what Stephen said, is that Moses had always had a softness for the plight of his people. He, he was aware of where he came from. He was aware of who he was. And he finally arrived at the age of 40 at a time of choosing. You know, could he stay with the lifelong security of his place and the riches and the power and glorious future, I might add, at least from a worldly standpoint? Or does he at some point join his people, the Jews, in their plight, which was only getting worse? At 40 years old, Moses arrives at a crossroads, and then we read, by faith, he chooses God's people and their plight and their difficulty over the life that he lived. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused the relationship of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose to suffer affliction with God's people rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He esteemed the reproaches of Christ, greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, because he had his eye upon the reward. So, back to Exodus, verse 11, chapter 2. We jump, and, and, the, and Exodus does it quickly, he, we jump over all of those years from age 5 to age 40 in one verse, from verse 10 to verse 11. It, it is here that Stephen, in his sermon, said this. Moses was learned in all of the wisdom of Egypt and was mighty in words and deeds, and when he was 40 years old, this is Acts 7, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong... He defended and avenged him who was oppressed, and he struck down the Egyptians, for he supposed that his brother, brethren would understand that God was going to deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. The next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting. He tried to reconcile them. He said, men, we're brethren. Why are you wronging one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away and said, who made you a ruler and judge over us? You want to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And at this saying, Moses fled. He became a dweller in the, in the Midianite land where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, now 80, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. So from Acts 7.25, we learn one thing. Moses, at 40 years old, was sure God was going to use him to deliver the people. He was aware of that. He knew of his calling. He loved the people. He walked away from the glamorous lifestyle because by faith he truly believed God had a purpose for his life. He was biding his time. He, he maybe was hoping his position could help them. But at 40, something happened to make him make a choice. I don't know if Pharaoh got sick and they were grooming him to be like the Pharaoh. Uh, I don't know if 
if this whole, you know, violence thing and this exposure was what caused him to, well, obviously to run, but what, what forced him to, to come out publicly, uh, we, we don't know. But we do know that at 40 years old, something took place. But he got ahead of the Lord, that's for sure. Right? The Lord's calling me. Let me go fix this now. And, and it didn't work very well. And, and the result of him killing a guy in protection of the people, and then the people turning on him almost immediately, one day, pushed him out of, of Egypt into you know, the, the deserts for the next 40 years. He, 40 years in the back of the desert. Can you imagine a guy who's lived with a, a silver spoon in his mouth now living in a tent in the dirt? Right? I mean, you couldn't have seen a more different uh, si uh, side of life. But he saw himself as God's deliverer. He was right. But he took matters into his own hands. And in the flesh, he tried to carry out a spiritual calling, kind of like Peter with his sword, you know, in, in the garden cutting Malchus's ear off. You can do the right thing in the wrong way, right? Or with the wrong strength. Before he was going to be ready to be the deliverer, God was going to have to teach him uh, who was in charge. Now, we mentioned it to you before, and I'll mention it again. Chapter 11 of Hebrews doesn't cover any sin or, or failure. It's a book on faith that God honors. These are the things God writes down about your life that, you know, he's blessed by. And all that sin has been forgiven. It's under the blood. That's why you have communion. It's under the blood. But, but your actions of faith, God keeps in a book, and he, he keeps track of them. And one day you'll be rewarded for them, for just trusting him. You'll get rewarded for his work in you. That's amazing, isn't it? So you don't find any of this that we read in here or even what Stephen records there in Acts chapter 7. But what we do read is, is that even in imperfect faith, God had called him. He was willing to follow. It would just take 40 years for him to learn uh, to trust the Lord. But I want you to notice what we read here in Hebrews. It says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. At 40 years old, Moses chose the will of his God and his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob over the worldly gain and the position he'd been given in the world. Now, that's, a, that, that's not something I think that we can stand far away from. You get to choose to do that every day. Am I, gonna, am I going to pursue the world and its gain, or am I going to seek the Lord? And sometimes those, those are diverse decisions because it's easy to choose for the world. But if you can choose to be identified as a slave with God's people, Moses walked away from what most people would work all of their life to attain. He walked away from, from what, what people would think it was the jackpot. This is, this, there's nothing better. You know, I've got all of this income, all of this power, but faith chose the will of God over worldly gain. And notice it says in verse 24 that he walked away from the passing pleasure of sin. I like that. There is pleasure in sin. You know that, don't you? There is some joy in sinning. There's some satisfaction in doing the wrong thing. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there's not. The question would be, if we were in the same position Moses was, would we have had this much foresight that sin's pleasure was passing? I mean, it looked like the Jews were going to be destroyed and the Pharaoh had the upper hand in literally everything, right? There wasn't one thing that you could look at from, a, from a, an outward perspective and go, well, you know, I see the handwriting on the wall. The Egyptians are on their way out. No way. They were on their way up. And the Jews were on their way out. And yet, that didn't seem to matter to Moses. He realized that, that sin was short-lived and that God's blessings was eternal. So he chooses rather to suffer affliction. It, it's still the truth that, that you and I, I think, have to face because the enemy will offer you all kinds of alternatives. Won't he? You probably have some alternatives. Oh, should I go to church and I have communion? Or fill in the blank. That battle goes on all the time, doesn't it? Am I going to get up in the morning and pray or sleep in? Am I going to or every day? The course and the quality of your life is indeed determined much more by decision than by circumstance. And that's what you see in Moses' life. He, he decided, right? He chose. That's the key. His circumstances were all in his favor in a fleshly manner. His spiritual life was at the end of a bunch of choices that he had to make. And, and Christian living involves making decisions to put Jesus first probably several times a day. I remember reading Napoleon's, you know, uh, his, his lectures to his armies. And one of the things he said was that he said, every battle is there, in every battle there's a 10 to 15 minute window where the outcome is dependent upon. And it's the time when you have to make a choice. And if you wait too long, you're dead in the water. 
And, and Moses did that. He came to a place where he had to make a choice. Look, look, Satan's not patient. Did you know Satan's not patient? He's a lot of things, but patient isn't one of them. Submit to God, James 4, 7. Resist the devil, and he will what? Why? Because he's not patient. Look, if you're on a diet and you're outside a Krispy Kreme, <laughs> there's like that one minute where you get to decide. Am I getting in the car, or am I getting a dozen donuts? And if you smell, harder decision. Somebody comes out with that frosting on their face, harder decision. You, you got to get in the car. You got to leave. And if you go away a minute later, you go, oh, I don't care. I'm victory in Jesus. <laughs> or fat, fat, fat in the Lord. But one way or the other, you're going to make a choice. It's the way the devil is. He's not very patient. So Moses had to make a choice. And I don't think it was an easy one, but he had, he had his eyes squared squarely upon the reward that would come, the long term, the outcome, the end. And the Lord says of Moses' faith, here's a man who had faith that pleases God because he made the right choice when given the opportunity, and he did so because he kept his eye on the consequence of the choice that he made. That's pleasing faith to the Lord. God spoke to Israel in the, in the wilderness through Moses there in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And Moses said right before he died, I choose heaven, or no, no, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So choose life, he said to the people. Choose life so you and your descendants may live. Joshua did the same thing in chapter 24, didn't he? Called the people to the same kind of decision. Choose today whom you're going to serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites. Me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. But it was a, it was a decision that faith demands, and, and you face it every day. You want to live a life that pleases God? You choose him, right? You, you choose him. You make that same choice. Elijah, with the prophets of Baal battle, said in chapter, what is it, 1 Kings 18, how long are you going to falter or halt between two opinions? If Baal is God, then serve him. But if the Lord is God, then you go serve him. Make a choice. Take a side. Take a pick. And Moses will teach us that biblical faith chooses God's direction even over all of what would appear to be obvious contradictions, right? Because the world will say, that's foolish. You could have had a better job. You could have made more money. You could have promoted yourself. You could have been somebody. I always, my favorite commercial that I ever saw was a picture of a, um, a young man, maybe college age, with a backpack across his back and a, and a rolled up sleeping bag. And he was heading into the, will, into the bush through tall grass. And the caption said, and to think he was voted most likely to succeed. And he had a Bible in his hand. He was going to the mission field. Well, the world might think you're foolish. That's contradictory. I guarantee you, nobody voted for Moses being a smart guy. Except the Lord. Right? God saw him as a man of, of faith. No matter the cost. And if you'll put spiritual pursuits before temporal pursuits, that's the kind of faith God is pleased with. Because it doesn't always... On the surface, look that way. Sometimes, well, there's, there's a lot of these faith-based ministries that, that point to earthly success as always being the will of God. And he blessed us, and he gave us money, and we became wealthy, and we're healthy, and you look at us. It's not in the Bible. It's in their foolish brains. But that's hardly a proof, right? I'm off, when I'm not sure of God's will, I'm always tempted to go with the obvious, the external. I'll take success over suffering, I'll take prestige over humility. I'll take glory over dishonor. My flesh walks in what it understands. And Moses, if he'd have done that, they'd have never gotten out of Egypt. They'd still be there. Walking by faith requires we see God and that we're not manipulated by what we physically see. At 40 years old, Moses, by faith, said, I can't be here. I can't be a part of this. I can't throw my, my dice with these guys. I can't throw in with their direction that they're going. I'm going with the slaves. It doesn't look good. It might appear weird, but it's the right call for me to make. And it's quite a step when you think about choosing suffering and personal loss so that you can be on track with God. And that's something only you could answer for yourself. But, but who does that? People of faith do that. And that decision is all the more difficult when you realize that he wasn't going to another group that was being successful. He was going to a group that were slave, enslaved, were stubborn, and for the most part, weren't very godly. In fact, you remember 40 years from now when he comes back and goes, come on, man, we're out of here. They go, yeah, get away from us. 
And even when he got them out, they, on a regular basis, said, so did you bring us out here to kill us? And when he finally got them to the land of promise, a, a year and, 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 you know, a few months later, they turned around and went, yeah, we don't trust God. I mean, it wasn't an easy people to join, right? It was a difficult folks to, to hang out with. And, and, and yet Moses joined them because he saw the long term. He had eyes on the reward. You've heard, maybe you've heard people say, well, the church is filled with hypocrites, to which we always reply, well, if you find a perfect church, don't join it, you'll ruin it. <laughs> well, Moses was about to join an imperfect bunch of people serving the Lord perfectly. So God's people aren't always socially acceptable here. They were slaves. They had no status. And joining them could bring you reproach. And Moses jumped out of Pharaoh's window, so to speak, and went running in that direction. He chose slavery to the Lord over slavery to the world. He chose eternal over temporal. He chose a life of difficulty over a life of ease. And God says, here's good faith. That's the kind of die to yourself faith. By the way, we, we did cover it a few weeks ago on Sunday morning, but you know, Moses is still around. He was at the Mount of Transfiguration. Pharaoh was nowhere to be found. Doesn't pop up anywhere else. 1,700 years later, there's Moses with Elijah talking with Jesus, and Pharaoh's gone. Why? Because Moses had his eyes on the reward. Could you see Moses sitting up in his tower of ivory, you know, with his powerful adopted family and looking out the window and saying, too bad those complaining Jews are suffering, so thank God it's not me. Or I can help them more from my power base. I'll help them more from here rather than jump in the, in the dirt with them. No, Moses had his eye on the reward. Sin's consequences are not always so quickly seen. And, and here's something Satan won't tell you. He won't tell you the shelf life of your sin or the risks that are involved. You'll get more warning on the cigarette package than you will from a temptation from the devil. He's not going to tell you it's going gonna, it's gonna to go bad, Right? He, he's not going to do that. Satan won't tell you, hey, look at a sinner. He always looks so happy and content, but just wait. In fact, when Job was struggling with his, all of his struggles there in chapter 21, he, he literally said to the Lord, I think life is easier in the world. And that's a misconception because the end of the world's life is death. And the end of the saint's life is life. If you look at the reward, right? And that's a lot of folks. That wasn't just... I read, I read this morning in Jeremiah chapter 12. This is what he said. Righteous are you, Lord. When I plead with you, you let me talk with you about judgment. Why do you let the wicked prosper? And why are those people so happy who deal so treacherously? That was Jeremiah. Lord, I've talked to you about how things work. It doesn't seem like you're handling it well. Those wicked people are happy as larks. And us, we, we can't find a place to smile. We read about the sons of Asaph in, in, in Psalm 73 that said the ungodly seem to have such an easy life, they increase in riches, that I've cleansed my heart in vain, I've washed my hands in innocence. There's no reason for me to try to be holy. There's no reward attached to it. And Moses said, that's not true, I see the reward at the end. That's a life of faith. It's how God would have you live and I live. Isaiah declared in chapter 21, my heart wavered and fear frightened me, and the night in which I longed, he turned into fear for me. Lord, I haven't had an easy life, but I'm so faithful to you. Why is this happening to me? Because there's a day of reckoning com coming. And these Hebrews needed to hear that they were, that as they wondered about suffering for their faith, that Paul said, look, every generation's had to face it. Let's look at what Moses went through. Here's a good line. This life is as bad as it gets for you. Right? This life is as good as it gets for the lost. So you're just moving up, and they're just moving down. It's a good thing to know, because the long-suffering of God and delaying consequences can sometimes have us choose the wrong path. But we should choose the right one. What did Job say in chapter 20 when he finally worked some of this stuff out? He said, did you know this of old, that since man was placed on the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. James wrote, you that have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury, you have your hearts fattened for the day of slaughter. It's all perspective, right? Well, Moses jumped out of the window and ran to the Jews with that understanding. And you get to walk out of here tonight with that understanding. Look, the world's no, no place to find hope. I'll be so glad when this election is over, I came tired of hearing about it. <laughs> My perspective is this, you want mine? We are a wicked nation. We've been given terrible choices. And the reason is we're a wicked nation. 
So we should be fasting and praying and crying out for God's help. You'll get better choices when we get closer to Jesus. You really want to make a difference? Lead somebody to Christ. If everybody in the church led 10 people to Christ, we could have a majority that would vote for godly people. Now you have a horrible choice to make. I don't care what choice you make. You're going to be wrong. <laughs> it's not going to work. We need Jesus, don't we, in our life again, in our land. So I think we're getting what we deserve, and what we want is God's grace and his mercy. But so far, the Lord has decided we should probably suffer a little. And here we are. So Moses chooses wisely by faith, right? And that's what God would have you to do by faith. Choose wisely. Don't compromise. Don't be so busy that you don't get your Bible out or you can't get to church regularly or you're not involved in a place of service somewhere. He, he needs that from you. He wants that from you. That's what faith does. Well, there's one more thing to add in verse 26 over back in Hebrews, and it says this. He said, He esteemed the reproach of Christ of greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, and that's because he looked to the reward. Look, you have a lot of blessings tonight. Have you ever made a list of blessings? Did you know that you're going to heaven? That's pretty amazing. You are going to heaven. We looked around and went, him? Yep, you are going to heaven. <laughs> Your sins are forgiven. That's why we have communion. Isn't it good to remind ourselves of that? Your sins have been paid for. The world lives in uncertainty and fear. We live in great confidence. After having been saved, and I got saved in 1972, so how long is that ago? Like, more than 10 years. I would hate to spend one more day in my shoes before I got saved, wouldn't you? I don't want to live there for five seconds. I, would, I, don't want to, I don't want to live a day in the shoes of an unbeliever, but I clearly recall what my life was like without Christ. Now, having said that, being a Christian isn't without its problems. In fact, most of what you go through, the world goes through. But walking with God, though it doesn't make you immune from difficulty, it does give you great hope, doesn't it? In the world, you have tribulation, but don't be afraid. I have overcome the world. Yeah. That's our difference. So Moses, he esteems. And by the way, the word esteem means to value after careful thought. He esteemed. He, he thought about it and said, no matter what the rest of this life brings, I, I'm making the right call. I'm placing the value in, in the right position. He took the worst thing walking with God had to offer. The worst thing. And he compared it with the, wor the best the world could give him, and he chose God's path. Isn't that right? The worst that God had to offer, slavery with his people in bondage. He walked away from the best the world had to offer. He was king of the world. And he thought it was worth it. What things were gained to me, those I've kind of lost for Christ, Paul said. You know, Tutankhamun's tomb, I don't know if you've had a chance to ever go see it, but he lived only 100 years after Moses. You know, and he shows pretty much what they found in his tomb, the opulence of the society from which Moses came. And then you read Psalm 37, verse 16. It says, a little that a righteous man has is far better than the riches of the wicked. Moses made the right choice, didn't he? He made the right call. I don't know if you English literature majors, anybody, I shouldn't even ask if anybody cares about that anymore. Um, I remember having taken an English lit class and, the, and, and our, our whole class was on the Merchant of Venice. So exciting. <laughs> but, but there's this beautiful, like, heiress, right? This very wealthy heiress of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Uh, and her name was Portia. And she wanted to get married, but her dad was a real protective dad, like most dads would be. And, and so a lot of suitors came around, for the most part, I think, because she had a lot of money. Um, and so her dad had these three chests made, a gold one, a silver one, and a lead one. And on the gold one, he had inscribed the words, he who chooses me shall get what every man desires. And inside, he'd put a skull, because he was going to kill the guy who took the gold. On the silver one, he put, he who chooses me shall get what every man deserves. And he put the picture of a fool, a clown, dressed up like a goof. On the lead one, he put, he who chooses me must give up everything that he has. And inside, he put a picture of his daughter, Portia. And, and all but one picked the gold or the silver except for a guy named Bassanio. So you won't even have to go read the book now. you got the whole story right there. <laughs> Who said he was willing to give up all for the sake of the one that he loved. That's Moses, right? I'll give it all up for the one that I love. And true persevering faith does that. 
He looks for the reward. It's a foolish choice to pursue temporal gain if you're going to lose eternity. If, if you're making choices just based on the present, you're really shortchanging yourself. Moses had to look way down the road and go, yeah, it's going to work out in the end. If you don't believe that, just read the end of the book, and you'll see. Fox's Book of Martyrs tells the story of many of the Christian saints who died under the Roman persecution waves, the 10 of them that came. But there's a story of a young man that's on the rack in, in, in 120 AD or so, and he's being told to recant his faith, and he'll be set free. And as he, 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 the pain just became unbearable. And, and before he was torn in half, he, he finally said, all right, all right, all right. And he stood up and he recanted his faith. And a little girl standing nearby who was next to be tortured said, You fool. For a moment's relief, you've given up for an eternity of torture. And they grabbed her and killed her. Now, that's doubtful theology. I don't necessarily believe God cracks at the last minute. He's lost his salvation. But I think the point's well made. You don't want to, you don't want to just cash it in here, right? You want to hang on to what really matters. So by faith, Moses makes the right choice. The eternal is set over the temporal. He values or esteems it to be so. It was a choice he would never regret. For the worst God has to offer is greater than the best the world has to give. Can you believe that? Then you'll be fine. And then you'll have faith, the kind that pleases him. Father, tonight as we have communion, so good that it would be on a night that we would think about how much you value us, how much you value you placed on, on our life in sending your son. And as we think about Moses, what a, what a difficult thing for his parents to, to let go of that boy that they so loved by the order of such a wicked uh, government agency. And yet, Lord, you were with them, and by faith they hid that young boy knowing he was called, and they didn't operate by fear but by faith. And then we think about Moses at 40 years old. We read in Exodus, we read in Acts that he, he jumped the gun, he he took life into his own hand and matters into his own hands. Oh, he was called, but he never waited for you to open the door. He tried it on his own. He presumed that the others would understand, and they didn't. But they would in time. And so, Lord, you leave all that aside, but you, you make note of the fact that Moses, in the midst of all of that imperfect kind of action, the thing that you noticed was his faith in leaving behind his worldly gain for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of your people. And, and he, he made the choice willingly. He esteemed it of greater value. He had his eyes on the reward that was coming. He chose affliction rather than the passing pleasures of sin. He took reproach over reward because there was a greater reward waiting for him. And Lord, that we might be those kind of people as well, that we wouldn't get swallowed up by the world while hanging on to the church and hanging on to Jesus, but somehow just barely getting by. May we value, Lord, eternal things far more. May we choose your ways, even if it means personal loss. May we live our lives in such a way that there are things that will last and remain, fruitfulness. May you do that with us. And may we find our name next to Moses in the hall of faith one day, because we too have esteemed, placed greater value even on the reproach that the world has to offer rather than the treasures that the world has to give. And Father, as we sit tonight in, in, in communion and in worship, would you remind us again tonight how far you went to save us, how, how much you paid so that we could have life, how, how much and how far you'd go to redeem our hearts, to forgive our sin. You chose the better part. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. And because of your faithfulness, we are here tonight with great joy. And as the world struggles to find hope and answers in a world that can increasingly has lost its mind, the church is standing victorious in faith. And the ways of the world aren't found in the lives of his people. You've given us freedom and joy and peace and love one for another. So God, may you continue to just speak to us and tonight as we, we hold the elements in our hands, remind us of the cost and of the payment which screams out to us of your great love. Jesus gave communion to his people. So 
If you don't know him tonight, one of the things that you want to do is you want to be sure that you invite him to be the Lord of your life. And that's pretty easy. You know, the whole gospel boils down to this. I can't save myself. Sin requires death. I, either I die or he dies for me. And because he died for me, then, then you can claim hold of that. You can receive that promise. He sent his son so that you might live. And as we're serving communion, as these folks from the outreach ministries, various places come and serve you. If you're sitting in church tonight, but you have no relationship with Jesus, just invite him to be the Lord of your life tonight. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's what the Bible said. So if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, you'll believe in your heart that he died in your place, that he's God, you'll be saved. And God will send his spirit to live in you. And your, his word will become alive to you. And you'll begin to know and, and know God in a way that will bring you great joy and peace. Bring you like Moses to that place where you make decisions based solely on his word to you. So do that tonight and then have communion with us. Rejoice with us over his sacrifice. Jesus gave us communion to remind us of his death and to help us look forward to his coming. So hang on to the bread, to the cup, till everyone's served, and then we'll partake of communion together.